everybody and welcome to the all nba show part of the all city podcast network i'm your host adam Mares. i'm joined by my esteemed colleague tim legler legs we got a lot of stuff to talk about today it was a good night in the nba good night in the nba definitely uh some some you know really interesting games I, i'm t- i don't know about you adam but i'm noticing when i'm watching these games more and more since the all-star break th- like even though unfortunately there are still a ton of guys out which always right. takes away from it. I just, you just feel, you do feel like the intensity level is different um, yeah. on a nightly basis. There's just a lot at stake every night now for teams, the way that they're jump, uh, so bun- uh, bundled together in both conferences in that middle pack and even out West at the top. So you're seeing now like the significance on a night to night basis of the weight that these games carry. It's been fun to watch. It feels like all these games, you know, the I don't know if it's the play in or what it is, but it just feels like there's a lot of bunching in the NBA. So there is the need for separation every night. And you see the teams after the All Star break that are starting to make that separation. I didn't get a chance to talk Nuggets. Usually I talk Nuggets every day, every time they have a game. I didn't get a chance last night. So I'm excited to break them down and share my thoughts because I thought last night's game against the Heat actually had some very interesting things. We're going to start there. We're going to move to Warriors, Mavs. We're going to talk Bulls, Pacers, Lakers, Kings, and then look ahead to tonight's slate as well. But first, we are presented, as always, by DraftKings. Stay tuned because you'll hear more about DraftKings and all they have to offer throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. Okay, we start with the Nuggets beating the Miami Heat, another rematch of last year's finals. The Nuggets get the win 100-88, to despite the fact that Jokic had just 12 points on eight shots. Jamal Murray had just 14 points on 14 shots. They get the win anyway, and thanks in large part to Michael Porter. He was the leading scorer, 25 points, 5 of 9 from the three-point line. But I would say to me, Legs, the thing I want to start with, the Nuggets are so impressive in how they can win in every different way. A shootout, fast break, slow down, grind it out, force the team to go away from Jokic, go away from Murray, and you're compromised somewhere else. I thought last night's win, the 10th out of 11 tries since the All-Star break, for the Denver Nuggets. I thought to, it was a meaningful one for Denver because it showed you how comfortable, not just win, but a 12 point win on the road, playing a style that Miami was trying to force. They wanted that style of game and Denver dominated that style as well. I, You basically are summing up like the entire takeaway from the game and I'll take it a step further. You're right, Miami wanted to make this game as much of a snail's pace as possible take the three point yeah. shot almost out of the game 16 made threes between the two teams i mean you know think about that that's that's just that's not modern nba um he'd only had five nuggets had 11 right. um and you're right they were able to win even though the pace was sort of being dictated to them and they didn't care because they know that they are going to be more precise when it matters most and to illustrate how impressive this was from a team standpoint adam Jokic and Murray scored a total of two points in the fourth quarter. Right? This was a two-point game going into the fourth right. quarter, or whatever it yep. was, two or four. Yep. And they scored 28 points. It was their highest scoring quarter right, um, of the game. Pretty consistent, actually. 26, 24, 22, 28 in the fourth. Highest scoring quarter of the game. And Jokic had one basket. Murray didn't score. It was it was Michael Porter Jr. It was Christian Brown. It was yep. Peyton Watson. It was Aaron Gordon, Justin Holiday, and then Reggie Jackson had probably the most significant run of any individual player in the whole game. He had seven yep. straight points in the yep. fourth quarter. It really helped them get some separation. But the fact that you can play a game that is dictated to you and is completely a half court game. Because that's what that turned into. And, and Miami likes their chances in those games because they're very good defensively. They are also a very good team at executing in those moments. Yep. We know they're incredibly well coached. Yet, despite the fact that it was possession by possession and the importance of these walk-it-up possessions 
and your best two players aren't putting the ball in the basket for you, and you still score 28 points, and it's because of the continuity. Yeah, and I love uh, Michael Porter Jr.'s interview after. We're going to talk about that in a second, yep. but um, it's it's just the continuity. So everybody's so comfortable, and they know exactly what they are trying to accomplish, possession by possession. And I just think I love about Denver. I think more than anything, Adam. And this is Jokic, but it, it's now permeated their entire team. They're they're so simplistic in what they do. There is absolutely no wasted motion, ball handling, <laughs> nothing. Nothing is without purpose, and it's so clean and simple and just take what's there and trust your teammate and they have got great trust and faith in each other and they're able to execute in these significant moments and that's why for me i still trust them more than any team in the nba if you're talking about a a, a one possession game fourth quarter late who do you think's going to get the best shots i think the denver nuggets are the quality of their possessions are better than everybody else's you said you trusted them more. I, I'll go even further. I trusted them more coming into the year, you know, because by virtue of the fact that they were the reigning NBA champs. But this 11-game stretch since the All-Star break, I trust them more than ever is how I would put it. And that even includes last year. They are playing so connected. And that's what it takes is a level of connectivity between your players to, to know how to read each other, but also to trust each other and to say, hey, if they're going to overload on this, we're going to go over here. Even though it's not our first option, they're giving us that, and we're going to go to it over and over again. Reggie Jackson, Michael Porter tonight, you know, clearly they were going to uh, overload on Jokic and Murray. Porter's the recipient, and he was up for that challenge. So Denver, there's that saying that Bruce Lee saying, you know, be like water. If a water goes into the bowl, you become the shape of the bowl or whatever. Denver is the epitome of that. Whatever it is that you the defense forms itself. Denver just forms immediately around that, takes on that texture. And to me, these last 11 games, they've always been this way, but these last 11 games have been the most I've ever seen of that quality, the ability to adapt to what the defense is giving you, their, their ability to adapt. It's the most I've seen in the regular season from them. It actually reminds me of what they were in the playoffs last year. Yeah, well, look, and this had that feel to it. The whole the whole thing had that feel to it from the beginning. There was just very little runs by either team. It kind of stayed within arm's distance of each other. Now, I'll say this. Bam Adebayo did an incredible job on Jokic. Like, yeah. if you go back and you just watched uh, – if you had a, just a camera on Bam the entire game and just went ahead and played that possession after possession, the amount of energy he was expending to yeah. get into front position, to three-quarter him, to dance around him – everything he had to do and then when he did catch in a decent position they were they were running a second defender at him or if he started to back down somebody was coming and that kind of led to his low shot total for the night but the greatness of Jokic is that despite the fact that he was being guarded that way and 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 you know basically had so much traffic around him he didn't really have a lot of room to operate how many guys in the league Adam that are star players could have that kind of an impact on the game as a screener and just a magnet Right. for defenders because that's really what his main role in this game was offensively screen and draw multiple people that's what he did and it just loosened up things just enough for other guys to have big nights and michael porter jr was sensational he's been sensational since the all-star break i mean this guy yep. is on a roll it's 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 becoming almost automatic now when he squares up for an open look like you just you don't doubt it at all mm -hmm. like the, you know you know what the result's going to be um, Aaron Gordon was, you know, physical and forceful the way you expect him to be. And then they just got these little little pockets of contributions, man. You know, Brown had, yeah. I think, seven straight at one point. Reggie Jackson had seven straight yeah. at a different stretch in the fourth quarter. And uh, it was just, man, impressive team win. And I know, look, Miami's shorthanded. They don't have Tyler Hero. That's a big element for them. Terry Rozier's still not quite where he needs to be. Right. Um, and just in general, this is their fourth straight loss. They're not playing great. But they 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 forced a style that gave them the best chance to win, and they still didn't have a chance in the end, losing by 12. And I think if you walk away from that game, because I, I see the perspective of, yes, but Bam guarded Jokic well. They did some things, took away Murray, this or that. But if you watch that game, Denver was not panicked. And what you're talking yeah. about is Jokic never swims upstream. You know, he never fights against the game. So Bam's going to be fronting him. He's using all that energy. There's just something to Yoke that knows this is a net positive for us because Bam is such an important piece for them. And if he's going to have to give 90% energy to shut me down, well, then I'm just going to make him work at that and open things up for everybody else. So I, I, I'm not trying to take anything away from Bam Adebayo. I love and appreciate, and Spo said this after the game, 
you look at, he didn't call these guys out by name, but I will. You look at Anthony Davis, you look at Joel Embiid, you look at Rudy Gobert, a lot of your marquee big defensive bigs, they've stopped guarding Jokic. They've elected instead to go to Aaron Gordon and play this Romer, yeah. and I get it. It's It makes sense in a certain way, but I do think there's an element of those guys not wanting to be outplayed, not, not wanting to take that challenge. Bam, he's still the help side guy, but he's also taking on that challenge with Jokic every single night and, and, and battling with him, and I respect the hell out of it. But like I said, Yoke doesn't swim upstream. He lets the game come to him. And if that's what the game called on, he allowed other people to go. And Denver just never looked uncomfortable in this game, despite Miami's best efforts. That's why I'm just, that's what I think sets them apart. And let me ask you this. Do you think there's any other team that can win as diverse a games as Denver can? Slow, fast, physical, finesse, three points, two points. Is there any team that you think can win the range of ways that Denver can? Oh, it's not even close. No. And that's why, you know, you're, we're watching this team now and it's that time of year and throughout the year, look, you know, they've had a good year, but it's also, you know, you want, we understood at times watching them and there was, they hit one stretch earlier this season where, you know, you were, you were telling me daily basis, like, man, something's going on with them. They're just not, they're just not there right now because right. There, there was no, there was no way you could have the same, the same level of urgency in the regular season when you just mm -hmm. won a championship. You just, it's just yep. impossible to maintain that. But now you see they're tightening up everything. And, and now they're, the, the focus is there every night. And in some ways, what you just said, I love the point you just made about Jokic, about not swimming upstream. I, another way to put that is when you look around the league at the, at the top players on these leagues, I'm, I'm sorry, on these teams, okay, the, the teams that really think they can challenge Denver, their main identity as a player is as a scorer. And they're going to keep. They're going to keep trying to do that. Whether it's Jason Tatum or Luca or Kevin Durant or Giannis, whoever it may be, no matter what, hell or high water, if they're having an off night shooting, guess what? They're going to keep doing that because that's what is the main identity as a player. Now, look, all those guys are are well rounded players. They do other things, but that is the main thing that they're trying to get accomplished every night. And that's not necessarily the case with Jokic. So on nights when he's being defended a certain way, because he doesn't have that mentality of trying to get 30, like I think that, that, that guys are like feeling like that's what they need to do for their team. He doesn't feel that way. So he isn't going to force it into bad spots. He's not going to take, you know, a bunch of mid-range jumpers with guys draped on him because he's trying to get to that number. Or, and I'm not saying they're thinking about the number, but that's the way they think they need to play for their team to win. He doesn't think that. So as a result, no matter what the game is looking like in front of him, he can accept that, he can embrace it, and now I'll just figure out a way to beat you with what's given. Now, there's yeah. some nights he gets great post position, and he'll just school guys, and he'll have the 35, 40-point night. He can do that. You want to play me a certain way? Good luck. I'll do that to you. But if you get played like he did last night, there are very few guys in this league on his level that would just like kind of accept that and morph into something else to beat a team. They're going to keep shooting the ball and they're going to be seven for 23 at the end of the game because they took a bunch of tough shots and it actually hurt their team. So the mentality that he has actually helps him big time in a game like last night. Well, I'll just go screen rebound and I'll, I'll be the guy that's just drawing so much attention. The game is really easy on the weak side of the floor. Yeah. And this Nuggets team, I just, the, the connected level they've played in. And I, I think we talked about this a few weeks back. Coming out of the All-Star break, Jokic sent a text message to the team that allegedly fired everybody up. And I, we don't know the contents of it. You, you can imagine something to the lines of it's go time. The opportunity's there. Nobody's better than us. Let's go out and prove it. And you just look at this 11-game stretch. They lost one game in overtime that was a Kevin Durant buzzer beater three away from being a win for Denver. So you look at that and just say, Denver, they flipped the switch and they're playing the best basketball we've seen of them, at least regular season wise. It's probably the best stretch we've seen of this Jokic era uh, against some really good teams, including Miami. If One other note though on this, I've long talked about Jamal Murray and how I don't think that he is in great shape most of the year. I think that this year in particular shows just how different he is when he is in great shape versus when he's not. And last night wasn't necessarily a great game. But here's a number for you. They were 24th in fast break points, averaging about 12 a game pre-All-Star break. Since the All-Star break, they're, I believe, third, third or fourth, and they're getting 20 fast break points a game. That's an enormous difference. And when you watch them play, there is just a better half-court pace. Now, it wasn't the, the case last night. Miami's trying to slow things down. But when you see a jump, 66% increase 
in fast break points over an 11 game sample size. That seems deliberate to me. And I think a lot of that has to do with Jamal Murray just playing with more pace, getting him to their sets more. And now you're seeing a fully unlocked Nuggets team. I mean, what do you think when you hear that stat legs? It feels really meaningful to me that they're getting almost twice the fast break points as they were before. No, it definitely does. It's it's significant, that kind of an increase. And, and ironically, last night, the, the fast break points were not really there, 20 combined for both teams. <laughs> there was not a lot of running. The difference in the game last night actually was the fact that Nuggets were plus 18 from the three-point line. I mean, yeah. it's very difficult to win in in this league now making five threes. And I, I actually clipped off a possession. I talked about this game last night on SVP, um, and I talked about what I said to start this show. The focus was on – the different ways that they were scoring in the fourth quarter without their stars having to do it and how impressive that is. And, this, you know, when that's just not the way teams operate, like at some point those star players are going to inject themselves in it, make or miss. They're going right. to fit because it's just time. It's time. It's my turn. Give me the ball. Let me go. We have to ride or die with me shooting the ball. And Denver didn't think that way last night. And that's why I was so impressed. Um, but, you know, I, it, the, the, the five three pointers made, and I had a play clipped off that I was going to do, but we changed the discussion. They had it. They had a couple defensive possessions last night where they chased four different three point shooters off the line on the right. same possession. Yeah, and and it's not. And it's because they were flooding to the paint to protect on dribble penetration or or bam slipping, and then they were flying out at shooters, yep. wings, corners, and it ended up with a very late in the clock contested three in the corner that was a bad miss at the end of the possession I was going to do, and so it spoke volumes about their commitment to it and that requires you to be in better shape and i saw yep. i definitely saw that last night i mean they they were flying around the court defensively and that's another advantage they have adam is just with this group the way they can read each other and the way they communicate it's not just offensively the way they execute it's defensively they don't miss assignments they're not they're not late for each other they're there and they understand what they are trying to accomplish depending who has the basketball and it just look, man, they look like a champion last night. And it was certainly wasn't close to their best offensively, but the game didn't allow that. So they right. went into a different style and they still were able to win going away at the end. So it's, it's just, uh, it's one of the better wins they've had. I think for that reason, it's hard to win when the terms are dictated to you of what the pace yeah. is going to be. And they did it yeah. anyway. And they did it anyway. Let me get to the quotes then after the game. I'm going to start. There's two of them we want to get to. But the first one was Michael Malone, who shared this story. You know, Reggie Jackson stayed in the fourth quarter a long time. Jokic was on the bench a long time. But then Murray is on the bench in the, in the clutch. Christian Brown and Reggie Jackson are your backcourt. And Denver's starting backcourt, KCP and Jamal Murray, they go to the scorer's table to check in. And those guys have it going. And Michael Malone said after the game, the two veterans walked back and said, let them have this. They're on a roll. Let them play. And, you know, you look at, to me, stories like that are what make this team so special. And then after the game, Michael Porter had something similar that stood out to you about, you know, this team, everybody takes pride when anybody scores. It doesn't have to be this or that. So what stood out to you about what Michael Porter said after the game? What was great about Michael Porter was he gets asked a question and, and you know, he doesn't get interviewed a lot, you know, in yeah. those situations. So I was really anxious to listen to him. And I got to coach Michael at the Under Armour, uh, the Curry All-American camp. When he, when he was, you know, still in college, this. yeah, man, he he was he was he was wow. coming out. So it was it was like you know it was uh, Markel Fultz was there, Josh Jackson, yeah. Michael Porter Jr. Like it was, and they have the top thirty players in the country at this camp every summer, and then they're going into like their their senior year of high school, and then you know these guys end up being lottery picks. So, and he ha his back was even messed up at the time, so he wasn't full participant, but he was doing some of the drills, and I was able to work with them and co and, and coach some of those drills and and coach some of the scrimmages. So, so it goes back then. He was very quiet, very soft-spoken, I remember. Like, like some of those guys are characters. Like, Josh Jackson never stops talking, ever. And then you had Michael Porter Jr. just kind of, like, kept to himself. Uh, he actually did a workout with Curry. So we, we, it's like three, four-day camp. Going into, like, the last day or the second to last day, word gets out, like, Steph's going to do a workout. And anybody who wants to watch can watch. And I was like, oh, this is great. My son was with me. I took my son out there because I wanted him to see all this. So we're sitting there and we're watching and we're watching Curry starts to work out. And the only other guy that was that he invited into the workout it was with him was Michael Porter Jr. So the two of those guys were working out together. And this, he was still a high school player. So it was a pretty cool thing to watch. Yeah. Um, anyway, I got I digress because I just wanted to tell that story. But so he's soft spoken. So last night they put the microphone in front of him. I'm like, oh, nah, nah, good. I want to hear him talk. And the first thing. You know, they asked him about, man, Cassidy Harberth asked him about, you know, wow, what a night for you. You know, great success. You're playing incredible since the All-Star break. 
and you know, how, you know, what's going on? How do you explain your success lately? And his first thing out of his mouth, did you see how good the shots were that I was getting and what they're creating for me? Right off the bat. Right. It wasn't like, yeah, man, I've been yeah. feeling really good. And like, I definitely Wide got open, my rhythm yeah. going. And like, that's the way 95% of guys in the league would answer that question. He immediately, yeah. and it was so smart. It was such a smart observation. Like, yeah. did you see, like, I, all I got to do is, is just finish it off. Those guys are doing all the work for me. And then he proceeded. She then, the follow-up question was talking about that starting five and the continuity and how comfortable they look in any pressure situation. And he goes, yeah, well, listen, you know, with, 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 you know, Jokic, who's an all universe player. And then Jamal, who's an, an all-star caliber player. And then you got AG putting his force on everybody and KCP. So he basically talked about the starters because that's what the question was about. And he finished his answer and Cassidy started to take the microphone back. And you could tell his awareness was, I don't want to forget about these other guys. Right, so then he like right. basically pulled the microphone back to himself and said, and he basically mentioned them all, Christian Brown and Peyton yep. Watson and yep. Reggie Jackson. And he went all the way down the roster and it showed me a maturity about understanding how far those kinds of things go in your right. locker room. Because it wasn't just about the starters. But I told you, the reserves had 26 points in the fourth quarter. Or not the reserves, but the, right. you know other guys besides the stars. Right. And he was like so aware in the moment to make sure, because like it was like you could see the wheels turning as soon as he got done talking. Like, oh man, I can't forget those guys. Like this sound bite's going to get played. Like I want to make sure those guys get acknowledged. And he proceeded to name every other guy that played in the game. And I just yeah. thought that was so impressive to do because you don't see that in those moments. I thought it was thoughtful, and I thought it was a guy that just gave two really good, honest answers about the state of their team right now. So I, I just loved every second of that. And it goes against his reputation, which, by the way, I think is very antiquated, maybe from a reputation coming into the league or, you know, as a guy that wanted to chuck. But Michael Porter's evolution into a willing and accepted role player, meaning a guy that has said, you know, I'm probably more than what I'm going to be, but I accept this this job that they're giving me has been one of the great stories in basketball. I love these stories. We talked about Clay earlier and Clay, now that he's no longer a star, watching him in in real time deal with that and accept a different role and how it's so compelling of a storyline. Michael Porter's kind of on the other side of that where he now excels and it shows you, I think teams look at it and go, okay, he's a 40% three-point shooter. Jokic and Murray are unstoppable. We'll live with 40%. But when you do overload your defense to Jokic and Murray, Michael Porter's not a 40% three-point shooter. Now he's a 60% three-point right. shooter. Now you're giving him those. And that's why after the game, when he's asked about it, he's like, yeah, those shots weren't normal shots. Those were wide open. I'm going to go five of nine when you give me that one, which is just so cool. Uh, real quickly on the heat, though, um, four straight losses. Jimmy Butler kind of unimpressive in those ones. And I thought the one – I thought Miami Heat played really hard. You're, you're right there missing some offense last night. But you expect Jimmy Butler to maybe be the guy that steps up and provides some. And in the fourth quarter, I kept waiting for it. And he almost looked passive to me. That was my big note. Jimmy Butler is – a He's a, a a finicky guy. You never know what you're going to get from him. In the playoffs, I think we know he'll be aggressive, but for some reason, he doesn't seem very aggressive right now. At a moment when you'd figure the Heat need it, they need they're in a their position in the NBA is not guaranteed at this moment. Yeah, no, it's one of the reasons, Adam. I have a hard time. I think just giving Jimmy Butler maybe even the credit he probably deserves. I, I just struggle with the whole well playoff Jimmy. Well, come on, man. What about regular season, Jimmy, when they need you? Like last it matters, night. Yeah, it matters. And you take two free throws in, in the entire game, and that's a big part of who you are. And your right. identity, look, and Denver's a really good defensive team, and they you know, they had bigger defenders on him at times, and that, that's probably made it a little bit harder for him. I get it. But come on, man. Like, he was a non-factor in the game offensively, completely. But he's like this star player that we talk about, and he's had these huge playoff moments, and there's no denying that. He has had those moments. I get it. But – at the same time, it's like, man, like a game like last night, like at no point to you, to what you just said, did he try to put his foot on the gas? Right. He just didn't. And and look, Jokic didn't either, but Jokic understood doesn't matter because what I'm doing is leading to great offense and we're making shots. We're scoring like every time down a court. That wasn't the case for Miami. Like somebody needed to go – create something and if it's e it's either going to be him or bam with that group because yeah. like rosier rosier just it's just not he hasn't been able to find that yet and they don't have tyler hero so it who's it going to come down to it's got to be jimmy butler so i agree with you i thought he was uh passive 
in the game and he'd have lost four straight. I do think this, and I said this last night on SVP, you haven't heard the last of the Heat. All right, you haven't. They're, they're, they're going to be a team. Right now they're, they're sort of bunched together there in, the, in that group of teams in the East where they are in eighth place, but they're two back in the loss column from fifth. So, like, they're in that group of teams right there, and that's going to be interesting to watch the rest of the way. Um, and you haven't heard the last of the Heat, and they're going to get Hero back, and Kevin Love no. didn't play last night, and he, he's important to them. So would you want to play the Heat necessarily in a best of seven other than Boston? Would any of those other teams really relish that? I don't think so. No matter what state of the Heat, you get them in a playoff series with Spolstra and then Jimmy yeah. Butler, who's like, oh, I'm going to play significantly <laughs> harder now. Like, you know, you, you get that. <laughs> You know, do you want that? No, I don't think so. So let's not, you know, we're not going to dismiss them. It, it's definitely been a disjointed season for them. And yeah. maybe they don't have enough firepower this year to actually make a significant run. And maybe they're a one, one round team, maybe, but yeah. I'm not going to believe that until I get there. Well, let's take our break. I got to say, Legs, I love that you're bothered by by it because I'm bothered by it too. I want guys to give a requisite amount of energy and effort all throughout the year, no matter what. Hey, what, if you, but, hey, what if I told you tomorrow you're going to get Thursday legs? Like today, <laughs> man, not too much. I mean, come on, man. What are we talking about? You get legs every day, baby. True, every day true. I bring the legs. Let's go. Hey. On the other side, we're going to talk about Warriors, Baz, Bulls, Pacers, and of course, Shea Gildas Alexander. Stat padding. We'll get to all of that. But first, I want to tell you about the Game Time app. What are you up to this weekend? It's Thursday. It's time to start thinking about your weekend plans. Are you going to a concert? Are you going to an event? Are you going to a game? Well, if so, you want to hop on the Game Time app because you can buy tickets there using their flash deals, their zone deals, last minute tickets. Makes it very easy to peruse the different values around a stadium. If you're looking at seats, they've got that map view. They've also just got the list by price view. And they have my favorite feature in all of these ticketing apps, which is the all in pricing. It's just a button that's on the front page. You push that and you're not surprised to check out with all these hidden fees. So check out what the Game Time app uh Create an account. Use code ALLNBA, A-L-L-NBA. You get $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account. Redeem the code ALLNBA for $20 off. Last-minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. Also want to tell you about DraftKings Sportsbook. The thrill and excitement of March Madness is here. I can feel it. I've actually started doing my our uh, March Madness prep for DNVR, our coverage prep. It's going to be a banger. I can't wait for you guys to hear about it. Very centered around gambling and making picks and putting some pressure on us as analysts to be right on that. It's going to be a lot of fun. If you want to get in on the action, you want to download America's top-rated sportsbook app. That's the DraftKings app. They give, they give new customers a shot to turn 5 bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. So download the code, uh, the sportsbook app now and use code all NBA. New customers bet that five dollars and get 150 instantly. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1 800 Gambler or visit 1 800 Gambler.net. In New York, call 877 8 Hope and Y or text Hope and Y 467 369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888 789 7777 or visit CCPG.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 and over, age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See DKNG.com slash promos for eligibility and deposit restrictions restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. All right, back here, segment two of the All-NBA Show. Let's move on now to the Mavericks beating the Warriors, two teams that have been very hot or cold lately. And this was a tied game or a one-point game halfway through the third period when all of a sudden Dallas just went on an enormous run. I thought in large part because of the size difference. We've talked about Gafford, who, by the way, 33 straight makes a field goal attempts without a miss which is insane but you had lively you had gafford you had pj washington at different points in this about 10 minute run to end the third start the fourth and they just looked enormous they were getting fast breaks they were getting dunks they were getting in the paint and scoring and this is my big question about the warriors i fear that they're too small well luca is huge as a wing player as a guard player and then you had those guys playing and finishing above the rim during that stretch and it just overwhelmed the warriors the shorthanded warriors i should mention um, what stood out to you when you saw that run and when you saw this game? Yeah, I agree. I think that, and that's the same thing I felt about the Warriors last year, even at the end of the year. I mean, they just looked like they were swallowed up by the Lakers. Like they, you couldn't even see guys yeah. on the court. And that's the same thing I felt about them last night. And yeah. look, you look at a guy like Trace Jackson Davis, who's, who's listed at six, nine, 
And Gafford's listed at 6'10", and Lively's like 6'10", 6'11", but they look so much bigger. Enormous. And and, like he's, and he's a good athlete, but those guys, their bounce is ridiculous. And the, the size of Luka and who he was operating against, like you got Pajemski in the post during that stretch, and it's just it's just not fair. Not fair what he's able to do. A couple dribbles, a quick spin, and he's at the rim for a three-point play, and there's just nothing Pajemski can do. So I think the size definitely was a different difference. And, you know, look, I'm going to start real quick with the Warriors. Okay. One thing I will say about the Warriors over the, the during the Steph Curry era has been on the nights that he hasn't played, I still felt really entertained by the Warriors and felt like they had a, a fighting chance. I don't feel that way anymore. Mm. Like if Steph Curry doesn't play, yeah. they're bad. They're a bad team. Like they're hard to watch. And it's because of the state that Clay's in yeah. and, you know, Chris Paul, like, you know, I'm looking at Chris Paul last night and I'm just like, is, is Chris Paul even a factor like yeah. for this team? You know, they were excited to get him back. And it's just like, what, what impact did he have on the game? Like he defensively, he cannot keep quick guards in front of him anymore. And that was a big part of what he was as a defender because he slide laddered and he was really strong and you couldn't get around him. Now you ISO a quick guard on him. It's it's forget it. He's like there. He's in their rear view mirror. Um, and then offensively, he's just not the factor that he was. So when you when you have these guys, you know, Kaminga's still worth watching. But for the most part, Adam, that's, that's one thing that stood out to me was like, man, this is a boring team, and they're not very good when Steph doesn't play. And I didn't feel that way before when Curry would miss a game. Like there was still something worth watching. And you thought maybe Clay could go off. And you don't feel that way about Clay Thompson anymore. And as a result, it's just it's just really difficult to watch them if Steph Curry doesn't play. And that's so that's what I felt about them last night. Nineteen assists for them too is I mean they're they're a team that relies on getting that ball popping. And you're right when Steph's not there, the whole thing is thrown off. He, he, Steph and Jokic more so even than say Luca. Like a team can survive around Luca. Obviously he's the engine, but they can you adjust to a different style. Steph and Jokic are the two guys that when they're out, the entire identity of the team is is thrown out of whack, and 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 you just don't know what you get. And that, of course, happened last night. I thought they battled, but to your point, they clearly looked out, man. The other thing about this game was that Luka Doncic goes out with a non-contact sort of in injury. It didn't look like it was terrible. It almost looked more preventative because they were on a run. But I, I don't know if you have a, just a, a quick thought on Luka going out. And if you saw the play where he reaches for the back of his leg and just kind of walks off the court. Yeah, I, you know, and I, there's been no update on that. I don't know that it looked very – it's going to be very serious to me. And I think, you know, they had, had the game in, in hand. The game was in control. Yeah. And so there's just like at that point you figure there's no way the Warriors are going to have enough to be able to win this game. Um, so you make – you know, you take them out. And I don't think it's going to be ultimately anything that's very serious. Something that stood out for me last night about Dallas, I, I realized that and they went a little stretch without Dante Exum. Exum's important to them. Yep. Um and he's in, he's got a great he's in a great role for them. But again, he's a good sized guard. Like he's a bigger guard, and he's not like a blur. But he's he's very under control in the way that he plays, and he's smart, and he's he can finish. And so I, I watching him last night, I was reminded like this is a guy that's going to be playing twenty plus minutes for them, and he's very yeah. important a uh, piece for them, particularly when Luca's out of you know out of the game. So that was impressive. Now let's get into this Gafford thing. So. Because I have – it's so weird. Like, people people in these some of the chats that I'm in were just talking hoops with, you know, with some buddies, and they act like it's not impressive. Like, all he does is dunk. <laughs> I'm like, let me tell you something right now, man. I can put these clowns on a ladder and give them a basketball, yeah. okay? And they're dropping the ball in the hoop. They're going to miss one out of 33, okay? So <laughs> the fact that he's doing it in live game action, and number one, it speaks to the fact that he doesn't do things he can't do. So this I think that's it. a good thing. That's yeah. a good thing, right? There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not criticizing a guy for that. And I also don't think, by the way, he's like going to like abort a play when he thinks like, oh, man, that guy's kind of close. If I jump, I might not be able to make this. So I don't want to keep the streak alive. Like he's not thinking right. about the streak. He's just playing. Screen dive, screen dive, screen dive. Offensive glass, take it back up. Those aren't easy to finish, by the way. He's got a number of those yeah. during his streak where he's going up contested shots after an offensive rebound. So – 33 consecutive field goals. And counting. Hey, let me ask you, and I haven't looked this up. I should have looked this up. I'm curious. How much has Daniel Gafford's field goal percentage gone up <laughs> during this streak? 
Like I yeah. would love to know how that many percentage points he's gone up because it's 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 insane to think about. Now, what's the is he tied? Uh, what are you two more? Uh, or something? I don't remember. I think he's two behind. I thought I thought he was two behind Wilt's record. Two two main two baskets. More, two behind two behind Wilt. And by the way, Wilt, you know, was was a dude that was seven one, guarded by like a lot of six six guys. Okay, now it was different. Wilt wasn't just like lob dunking it. He was like shooting finger rolls and like drop steps and running the floor and all that. But so what Gafford's doing is certainly more limited, obviously. But I am like literally can't believe, and I didn't. I don't know, man. I wasn't paying attention to it. You texted me the, like the four games he was playing, twenty eight in a row, and what those were, and I was like, "Oh my goodness!" And now <laughs> it makes five more in a row, and so it's going to yeah. end at some point, man. Now it's like we're, that might be tonight. They play Oklahoma City. Maybe Chet Holmgren yeah. goes up and gets a piece of one Ooh. and breaks this streak up. Let's watch it. That would be great. That, that would be a nice little challenge, actually, for Chet uh, just to put in his mind. Um, by the way, by the way, yeah. real quick. And we're going to maybe at the end, hopefully have time preview some of these games. They got Oklahoma City tonight. They beat Oklahoma City by 35 points uh, a month ago. So this is a really important game for Dallas. Because yeah. I think you're going to get OKC's best after that beatdown. And Dallas has just won four straight. Right? They were hot, and then they were really bad, and people were questioning them. And now they won't. But here's the thing. These four wins they've had, three mediocre teams and one terrible team. That's who they've just beaten in these four games. That's not what you're getting in Oklahoma City. So hopefully Luka plays. My goodness, I couldn't imagine if he doesn't play. I'm so looking forward to this game. But this is going to be a great, great benchmark game, I think, for the Dallas Mavericks to give us an idea. Because I, as you know, I'm high on them. Like the additions. You know, One yeah. of the guys they picked up, I said I liked. He just made 33 straight shots. I think I called <laughs> that one right, Adam. All right? All right? <laughs> but they so, lost three games so, the other day, Legs. You got to be wrong. <laughs> I know, man. I know. So I'm. Um, I'm. Um, listen, this is a this is a big one tonight, and I hope everybody's on the court because I want to see well, if they're, well, uh, they're not. I'm seeing here in the chat. Mark, they're saying Mark Stein has reported that Luca did not travel with the team to OKC and is out tonight. So I have not seen that. That would make for a real bummer tonight because I'm with you. Oklahoma City is also in that moment. By the way, last night we didn't even mention this. The Nuggets win put them in the first place in the one seed out west, somewhere they had not been for three months. So it, it's sort of, even though it was only a half game, OKC can retake the number one spot tonight with a win. There is a psychological thing to, you know, when the favorite retakes that spot, it, it kind of feels a little meaningful. But no Luka tonight. That's a bummer. Uh, let's keep it moving because we got a couple games to go to. The Bulls Pacers. Um, this one had an incredible finish to it. It was actually a very good game. I got to give credit to I, the Chicago Bulls play a tough. They're uh, they're probably my favorite bad team right now. I, li I like it. Uh, you get like you big time that. shot making in this game. Five of six from Caruso from three. Torrey Craig had a huge three in the corner in the clutch. Dasumu had a big time isolation move and score. Miles Turner on the other side had, I don't know, seven threes it felt like in the clutch of this game. It was a great back and forth game. Siakam had a big block to save a bucket in transition that just was pure heart and effort. But to go to the end of it, we're going to overtime because DeRozan hits an incredible shot. Uh, actually, you get a, an offensive rebound off of a free throw, and then DeRozan hits an incredible shot. But to end this game, missed free throw from DeRozan. You get the rebound. You have a chance to call timeout. The Pacers elect not to do that. I thought there was a little confusion on the court. They dribble up, and they do not. They get a, They end up getting a clean three, but it was Halliburton running, or actually, I don't even think it was Halliburton. I don't remember who it was, running into a tough three on the move. What did you think about how this game ended after it was a lot of great shot making and a lot of back and forth? What did you think about the last possession? Well, I vehemently disagree with not taking that timeout. And, I, and I'm going to tell you why in a second. First, go back to that. He misses the free throw. Halliburton is standing at the three-point line because he's, he's, he's not on the lane. He's, he's kind of standing there. He's kind of got his hand on the, on, the, uh, on the Bulls player, just making sure the guy doesn't run in. Ball comes off the rim. They grab it. He immediately turns toward the bench. And he almost is taking a step toward the bench because yeah. he's assuming they're going to yeah. take a timeout. So now he doesn't break back for the ball. So as a result, the ball comes up the sideline without him. And then he runs up the court because he realizes they're not taking a timeout. He runs sort of over to the right sideline and gets buried along the bench. They, they, they try a couple of quick actions. Nothing's there. They finally throw it to him with virtually no time on the clock, and he jumps 
And then Fender goes over his head and he has to like double clutch a three pointer and he ends up landing on his backside as he shoots a three that doesn't even get to the rim. And that's how the game ends. And he immediately stands up right in front of his bench. He turns, he grabs his temples like this, like he can't believe it. And then yeah. you can see him talking to the assistant coaches as he's walking off the court. Like he's going like, why no timeout? Why are we not taking a timeout? And then he just kind of shook his head and then jogged off the floor down the tunnel because he was clearly so frustrated. And I completely agree with him. And I'm not saying it's always the right thing to do on that right. situation. But here's what I'm saying. Down three is completely different to me than down two. Because down two, the entire court is at your disposal. And so you just want to play? Go ahead. By the way, though, if the ball's not in the hands of your best player, I'm not feeling great about that situation right. and yep. trusting whoever whoever yep. comes up to just get to the rim or shoot a midi or whatever it may be. Okay, so that's first. You're not down two. You're down three. Secondly, when you have a player that is this dynamic as a three-point shooter and playmaker, it's incumbent upon you to take the time out and dictate terms. The ball is going to be in his hands. We have to make sure the ball's in his hands. And you can draw that up from a side out of bounds and make sure that happens. And in that with 10 seconds, which is what it was, you can run him from the sideline all the way into the backcourt if you want to. Let him catch right. it. Coming yeah. up the floor with a head of steam, get a screen at half court, get a screen at the three point, whatever, and make them make them react to him, probably a blitz of some kind. And now he's good enough and big enough to get the ball to the open guy for a clean look. I just think when you have a player that's that good at creating offense and is that good of a deep three-point shooter that could read yeah. a mistake on a ball screen and shoot a deep shot, why in the world would you take that with you? That timeout's in Rick Carlisle's pocket. Why in the world would you do that when you have yeah. an opportunity? Just to say go play, this isn't the Suns with Bradley Beal, Devin Booker, and Kevin Durant on the floor, and, and like all three of those guys are coming up, so you don't care which one of those three guys has it. right? They're elite-level scorers. They don't have elite-level scorers on the Pacers. They don't have any. They've got yeah. a good offensive team, don't get me wrong, but they've got one star creator, and it's Tyrese Halliburton. And by doing that, you didn't allow him to get his hands on the ball, really. And, and I just disagree with it. I'm sorry. I, I And not always, like I said, sometimes I would look at it differently. Not in that kid's situation with that particular player down by three with that much time. Draw a yeah. Call a timeout and draw something up to dictate the reaction you're trying to get out of the Chicago Bulls. That's my point. I think even in those moments, you know, you mentioned 10 seconds. I'm okay with you trying to press the advantage. But you got to read the first three seconds there. Like three seconds, you go. You the defense isn't matched up in transition. Okay, we're all right. Let this run. But to your point, you want the ball in your best player's hands. That was not the case. And you watched the clock ticking, and you saw there was no organization. There's no advantage. Nobody's open. And when you don't call the foul, like you could tell with about five seconds left, they're not going to get a clean look here. They're just not. And if sure enough, that's how it played out. So I'm with you. Halliburton's with you, by the way. After after the game, he even brought it up and referenced it. So I think everybody is with you. The last game to talk about, at least from last night, uh, the Kings beat the Lakers again. Sabonis, DeMontis Sabonis moves to 10-0 and all time against Anthony Davis. That feels very meaningful to me. 120-107, and it was a game that Sabonis looked like the best big on the court. 17 points, 19 rebounds, 2 assists to go against Anthony Davis's 22-10-3. But even those numbers don't tell the story. What's up with this matchup, Legs? Why does AD struggle so much with Jokic and Sabonis? That's a good question. Well, Jokic is its an easier answer, I think, than, than Sabonis, sure. right? Jokic is just the, I mean, the, the, the versatility offensively. Sabonis has some versatility in his passing game. It is a big part of what they run with their weave action and all that stuff up top and as a screener. But he's not going to beat you as a scorer in a real you know multi-dimensional way he's coming at you like like a bull and he's just going to just plow through you and he's going to outwork you and maybe that's what it is with anthony davis yeah. you know who you know when you play against Sabonis, you better be at your house like drop before you drive to the arena like putting your hard hat on man and your construction vest because it's about to be a war in the paint and Maybe that's just not what AD's up for when he plays against him because there's a relentlessness to Sabonis where you got to kill him to stop him. And yeah. we both know that's not necessarily in AD's wheelhouse. I don't, now, don't get me wrong. He's been playing great. And when he is up for that, 
forget it because Sabonis shouldn't have that kind of success against him. He just shouldn't right. if AD is completely locked in because his length and athletic ability should be a real problem for Sabonis to score on because he's not going to shoot the ball from deep. Like, rarely. His mid-range is not anything to speak of. He's trying to get to one place on the floor, and if you're AD, you should be able to stop that. And yet he he AD has struggled with it against him and struggled with the overall. His team success hasn't been there. I thought this was a sad loss for the Lakers because – now they're separated by four games in the loss column. If you win that one, you're separated by two. There's still some hope that you can claw out of this play-in or, or or what have you. But the Lakers, by virtue of losing that game now, I think you can keep they're – the, they're a play-in team. They're more likely a road play-in team, whatever. But I just thought that the energy level was pretty sad for a team that was – that had such a big game. But Anthony Davis, LeBron, D'Angelo Russell, who had six points in this game – I thought Austin Reeves was the only guy that kind of had like some energy to them. And we just talked about Denver has been focused coming out of the break. Denver's the reigning champs. They were already a top three seed and they have had this focus. The Lakers are fighting for their lives and they have a game like last night where you watch it and you go, is that the best you have in a moment? It might be. That might, it might be as simple as that legs. That's just the best they have. You know, this is crazy the way this is shaping up. And I don't know how it's going to play out because of where Sacramento and New Orleans are situated just barely above that that spot for the play in but are you telling me we potentially could get phoenix dallas as a play in yeah. like i mean with yep. booker and luca right and then you yep. could get lebron versus curry yep i mean this is what we're looking at potentially in the, uh, i mean my goodness you talk about compelling drama now that seven eight's different at least you got another chance at right. it but imagine if you got that and dallas wins that game and now you get phoenix you know with durant potentially taking on LeBron to go home go. for the summer or, or Curry. Like that, that's yeah. what we're looking at. Unless something change you look yeah. at Sacramento's in a dead heat with Phoenix. And so, I, you know, I don't know how you think that's going to play out ultimately. And new Orleans is right there a game up. So there, yeah. those three teams are, are so bunched together. Your guess is good as mine, because the one thing that I think we both can agree on, the one thing you haven't seen this year with the exception of a few teams is any sort of consistency. Right. And and that's why this has been a wild roller coaster ride of a season. You're trying to find bigger trends than just living in the moment. And these teams have made it hard because of their inconsistency throughout the year. And you're waiting for them to find their footing and go on a run. And it just really hasn't happened for that group of teams. We'll move on to one last one here. And that is I'm a believer in the basketball gods. Kind of tongue in cheek, but I'm a believer in if you do things the right way, there are these rewards that come back to you, not because some divine intervention, but just because of nature. And I have this thing that if you tempt fate, if you even on little small insignificant things, if you if you go against the right, then those things will come back to haunt you. Shay now making a mountain out of a molehill, but Shay at the end of a game on Wednesday, foul or actually on Tuesday against Indiana, down I think nine points, fouled so that he could get the ball back with 10 seconds left and score a bucket to keep his 30-point game streak alive. Legs, I hate these things. A meaningless stat pad from an MVP candidate and a great player, a meaningless stat pad for a meaningless record. Who cares about this 30-game streak or this 30-game record? He sets a franchise record for most 30-point games in a season, surpassing Kevin Durant, by the way. But to do it in that way, that feels so dishonest, it rubs me the wrong way. Oh, Big time, Adam. And look, we both love Shea Gilgis Alexander. And love the him. guy couldn't possibly do things more right than he has done them. And the way he carries himself. And he's a more of a lead by example guy. He's unguardable. So he gives that team a lot of swagger because they know every single night they've got a dude that there's no answer for. And and everybody else kind of falls in line. So we love him. We love the team success. We love the way they play collectively, everything about it. That's yeah. why this felt so dirty. Why would you do this to yourself for a stupid streak like that late in the game? By the way, just so people understand the exact parameters, you're up 10 with yeah. 14 seconds left in the game, and you go up and run and foul a guy in the backcourt yeah. to force two free throws out of Nembhart so that you can get the rebound defensively or get the inbounds after the second free throw and go coast to coast, knowing that no one's going to want to foul you or stop you 
And we all know the protocol. Let's say he had fouled him in the backcourt unintentionally. Let's just say it was just like it, he was just up there and he, it was incidental right, contact. And the, ref, yeah. right? and the ref blew the whistle. And you kind of would know the difference as a fan and you're an analyst, you're watching, right? No big deal. And then he would get the ball after the second free throw and they would dribble it over half court. And then just pick that's it up and hand yeah. it to the official. We just took we just took an eight point loss, and that's that. So what he did, going coast to coast in that situation, to me, and I don't think he's all about that, Adam. But it's he's it's not, like I don't think things. so. That's it's one of those things where you see all the time, and and we just saw yeah. this like with with if you watch the news or politics, whatever, like you see this all, stuff all the time. People do something. Oh, I'll, I'll give you an example. So the 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 uh, South Carolina LSU women's game. The fight that broke out in that game, okay, late in the game, and then you come out and say, the player says, "I apologize, that's not who I am." Well, I don't know, man. You just you just <laughs> shoved the girl <laughs> as hard as you are. could to the ground. Like, so what do you mean? Isn't it yeah. more? Isn't it more? I'm really sorry that I did that, and yeah. I try not to, you know, be representative of that, and I let my emotions yeah. get the best of me, and I'm sorry, and I'm gonna do right. everything I can to make sure that does not happen again. But to yeah. always say that's not who I am. Well, I don't know. It looked like that's who you were right there. And the same right. thing with Shane. I know. I kind of feel like I know that's not who he is, but it's you can't defend that. That's, that's a that's bad what it is. look, man. That's a bad look because the only thing that you come off representing is winning. And, right. and you do your thing every night because that gives your team the best chance to win. And that's why you play that way. And, you know, you do it so officially. So to do that and go out of your way to make everybody know you're really cognizant of a personal scoring thing, that felt dirty. And it's yeah. a shame because it's going to be hard to unsee that. It also just makes you wonder what other possessions did he, you know, he did that on that meaningless one. But is there other possessions where it's like, hey, man, second quarter, I'm a little behind pace. I got to go. You know, it's just those little things. Again, hey, I don't want to make a know, mountain out of real a quick. Real quick, I don't know if you remember this. Yeah. You, you, you might be too young, but you, you know we've seen these kinds of things happen before, right? And one of the most famous ones was Ricky Orlando Davis. was playing. I believe it was the Pistons. I think Doug Collins was coaching the Pistons. He might have it might have been the Wizards, but I think it was the Pistons. And Anthony Bowie was a player on the Orlando Magic, and he was one assist shy of a triple double. And the game was basically over. It was not going to be a you know one possession game yeah. it's kind of like this like 10 point game whatever and the magic called timeout late in the game like in this situation to set up a play where anthony Bowie could try to throw the ball in from an inbound spot because that's all the time that was left to get a direct assist to get his triple double and doug collins told his team you know what if they want it that bad we're going to give it to him he had all five defenders standing right in front of the bench next to him. <laughs> and Anthony that's, Bowie that's took great. the ball at half court. He took the ball at half court because that's where it was being taken out. And he threw it all the way down underneath the basket. And somebody caught it, like caught it in one motion, laid it in to get his 10th assist. And Doug Collins was like clapping and like walked off the court. Like, you wanted that bad game? Uh, so like last night, imagine yeah. if, imagine if, uh, Should you know, have. they thought the Pacers thought her two nights ago. You know what? Go ahead. Everybody get out of the way. Let him have it. Let him get this I'm one. Yeah. To make more of an example of the situation. That's kind of what I, I thought it. about when Shay yeah. did that. I love it, man. I think it's hilarious. Uh, I remember Ricky Davis is the one I always remember because if you remember, he was one assist or I think a rebound shy. So he shot it on the wrong hoop to grab the rebound <laughs> trying to get it. So I think that one, that might be my favorite trying to get a triple double at the end of game moment. Um, hit that outro music for us, super producer Emma. Real quick as we get out of here, legs. Tonight, Phoenix at Boston. We thought we were going to get a bunch of games. Philly at Milwaukee. Imagine what a great game that would be if everyone was healthy. Not the case. Dallas at Oklahoma City. Also not the case. But at least we get Phoenix at Boston tonight. We're like, this is a good game. And I just called that game uh, when they met up in That's Phoenix uh, last weekend. So now you get the rematch. And um, you know, Booker didn't play in that game. Uh, and now is he playing tonight? He is playing, right? Booker, Booker should be out there. He was, so he was, he's been out there. Both teams at full strength. Hopefully, um, let's let's get the rematch and see what it looks like. I also like the Clippers at Chicago, just because Chicago right now, man, they're they're playing tough. I like the way they're playing. The Clippers have not been playing tough, so I'm interested in that one as well. I don't know. Any thoughts on that game? Listen, all I all I care about is is when these when these top teams get together, man. Give me something worth analyzing. It's been very very difficult. I'm gonna actually do a little research tomorrow 
on this topic for tomorrow's show, talking about the difference in, in the number of games that like top guys are missing right. um, relative to what it used to look like and why this has become so hard to figure things out in the regular season. Yeah. All right. If you guys are watching this on YouTube, you're going to want to stick around. We are doing a new series where we break down a play. We're going to have a great play from the Boston Celtics that they've been running uh, just a handful of times this year. So we have new content coming to our YouTube page that you're not going to want to miss. Make sure you're subscribed. Hit the little notification button so you get notifications whenever we publish a video. And we're going to see you tomorrow. Hit that like button on the way out. Like the mayor.